I have all kinds of sticks. Different size? Yeah, and it hooks over this board that I have the paper on. Mm -hmm. And I lean my hand on it. It's so funny, people are so disappointed when they meet me because they expect this gothic kind of twisted, I don't know what they expect, but it's not me. And instead they get Donny Osmond, you know, it's like, you know. The worst thing to do for any gallery was black and white, disturbing, pencil drawing. Made my life a nightmare. Uh-oh, they're coming to get me. No. <laughs> I've never ever looked at what was happening around me in the art world. I've always just done my thing. And when I went to university, my art professor said, don't do this. Uh, figurative work went out in the Middle Ages. In fact, one of my professors called me my medieval friend. Uh, they said, don't do this, do drawing for drawing's sake, you know, just make the mark is important. And I cut my classes and I taught myself how to draw the way I wanted to draw. They didn't teach me it. I had to teach myself from books how, how to draw the way I wanted to draw. Because I had it in my head. I knew what I want. I hadn't seen it. But I sort of knew what I wanted. And I, you know, so I was working and working and working. And I didn't care what anyone said to me. And I think that's because I was confident. And I was confident because of my parents. They gave me the confidence. If I had a little bit of self-doubt, they would have crushed me at school, totally. But I tried everything. I tried not to do black and white disturbing pencil drawings because it's very difficult to make a living. And everyone I showed it to said, no, we don't show pencil drawings, we don't show black and white, we don't show disturbing. Why don't you just paint? Because it's not modern, you know, splashy. I'm not fashionable, really. I'm not um, au courant. I was born in New York in an unmentionable year. <laughs> I was a very good little girl in the suburbs of New York. I was very, very polite and very um, kind. And my mother uh, expected a lot of me. And I was an A student. But then I'd go down into the basement. <laughs> they gave me a little studio in the basement that I could paint. and. And um, I used to do these horrendous, I mean really horrendous images. Very angry, rage-filled images, just about being alive, you know, just, ah! And my parents were very kind and encouraging. They didn't say, don't do that, or we should give her some help, psychiatric help, or they just accepted it. And they even showed it to my relatives, it was so funny. I was a sweet little girl in a nice little dress and you know, sitting like this and my relatives would come to visit and my mother would go, look what Laurie did and there was this guts and gore and these awful monsters and you know, and they go, you know, that's nice, you know, and my cousins wouldn't play with me. They were <laughs> so yeah, my parents were very, very accepting and encouraging. I was very lucky, very, very lucky. I hated school. I was a good student, but I hated the restrictions and the restricted thinking. I used to have black notebooks, black sketchbooks, and I used to do caricatures of all the teachers and all the uh, cheerleaders, and they used to pass them around in the, in the um, classroom. So I was known already for my black books, and, you know, and the teachers, actually no one stopped me. The teachers got, they got a hold of it too. And they thought it was great. So I was, <laughs> maybe it's because of the way I look. I don't know. I was very lucky. People were very kind to me. I hated high school more than anything. I hated it. Every day of it, I hated it. And last year, they asked me to be honored in the Hewlett High School Hall of Fame. It's, they have a Hall of Fame for all the people who made it big or whatever. I don't know. I don't know why they think I made it big, but anyway. So I thought that was the funniest goddamn thing. So I went back for the first time in 45 years. It was the first time I went back to Hewlett, Long Island. And I was being honored with several other people from different, you know, different classes. And everyone was saying, 
I am so honored to be in Hewlett. You know, Hewlett made me who I am, and Hewlett High School was wonderful. If it wasn't for Hewlett High School, and then I got up. And I said, I am known for very tortured, bizarre, and angst-ridden drawings. It all began in Hewlett High School. <laughs> People have said to me, oh, why do you do such twisted, awful images? Why do you do disturbing images? Um, how can you not? Being a human being and seeing what goes on and seeing life, how could you not be disturbed? Even a happy person, even a well-adjusted person should be disturbed by what, you know, what's around. I got out of America as soon as I could. I always felt like a foreigner in my own country. So I went to live in France, Belgium, Germany. Wherever my work started selling, I followed my art around. And I vowed I'd never ever live in London and I was there the longest. I just fell into the whole London scene and the English crazy people and I felt at home there. But I always felt like a foreigner, but that was okay because I was in a foreign country. Well, I lived in six different countries and yes, it made me see myself more clearly, and it made me see my country more clearly. Uh, I couldn't have seen the United States if I just lived here. And since coming back, it's been very shockingly clear what America is like. And I, I feel privileged to be in this position. When I was traveling around a lot as a student, and as a poor artist, all I could afford were pencil and paper. And when I had to stay at somebody else's house or sleep on their floor, oil paint smell. And it was easier for me to just, you know, quickly do drawings. And it's easier to transport, it's cheaper. And then suddenly I saw, because I wanted to always paint like Van Eyck, Memling, you know, very, very detailed. I love that, but no one could teach me. And I suddenly saw how to draw the way they painted. They painted with tiny little white lines, it's called egg temperer. And they used a tiny little brush and they build up form with these lines, thousands and thousands of lines. And, and I thought, I can do that with pencil. I have a permanent point pencil and I build it up with thousands and thousands of lines to make the form. It's an insane way to draw, it's insane. Pencil is juicier. Ink is too flat. See, my hand already knows what it's doing. I don't really have to... I have to think for the um, cartoon. But this bit, I don't really... Because once I've established where the, the light is, I know what I'm doing-ish. It takes longer for me to make a drawing than a painting it, of the same size. But the kind of luminosity you get. You know, usually drawings, people draw and they smudge and they, you know, it looks flat. But because I'm building it up slowly with all these lines, it looks real. It looks uh, 3D. So it's, I invented a totally insane way to draw. And a lot of people, when you're doing pencil, they have a desire to smudge. Everyone, I don't even touch the paper. I don't go anywhere near the paper, so. Someone bought one of my drawings, and then six years later, he called me up and he said, oh my God, I just saw something under the table in the drawing. <laughs> he had lived with it in his living room for six years, and he suddenly saw something I hid. So yeah, I, I hide things to amuse myself, and I don't point them out to people. And yeah, it's, you know, people are so, used to looking at a painting like that. It's very quick. Modern art is very quick. You get the color, you get the shape, you look at it and you move on. But my work takes a lot of time and effort to make and to look at. I need a theme to hang my imagination on, otherwise I'm all over the place. So I need to you know, calm me down a bit, to give me like a corridor, because otherwise I could just never stop. <laughs> I've been doing this for, since I was four years old, so I know exactly when it's finished, by now. I used to not know and overdo it, 
or underdo it, but now I know. Except for these really big ones, they're very challenging, that's why I want to do them. But um, yeah, I just, I know my craft right now, at this point. The first thing everyone asks me is, how long does this take you? And I used to make up a number, because I had no idea, and I didn't want to seem like an idiot. So, I just say, what, three months, four months, I don't know, it doesn't, the thing is, I don't really want to know. I don't want to face a huge blank piece of paper and think, oh my God, this is going to take me six months if I work every day for 10 hours. I don't want to know that. That would depress me. I would not work. I would just go shopping. So I just take it as it comes. I don't do the whole, I just do a section. I say, today I'm going to do this, and tomorrow I'm going to do that. So that's what it takes me. It takes me a long time. You know, in order for me to be able to draw like that, it took me 50 years. So the drawings took me 50 years. Because my drawings take so long to do, I have a little notebook next to my drawing table, and when ideas pop into my head, I, I write them down. I'm like a frustrated writer. I write down either the title or the idea, and then I will play around with a format, a composition in a little sketchbook for a while. And then when I finally get to the paper, it's like a painting basically. I do a cartoon, the line of the drawing. And because I'm not drawing from anything, it's from my head, that takes the longest to get everything correct. The perspective, I wasn't taught perspective. I wasn't taught perspective. I went to the best university for art in America. They didn't teach me any, I had to teach myself. So the perspective, which I still don't know how to do, so everything is a little bit off. And um, just to get everything to look real. And then once I get the whole thing mapped out, I go into the detail slowly. It has to be very slow. And gradually, it picks up more and more detail. And I go around and around, pick up more and more detail, until finally, it's off on its own. And it's different than when I, what I imagined. Let's say, for example, a woman standing in a kitchen. It becomes an insane housewife with all these crazy gadgets and technology is like choking her. And it just, the drawing, it's like writing. You know, you get your characters, you get your plot, but then the characters become real and take off and get their own thing. So then I'm drawing and go, oh yeah, okay. You know, and I go with it. So in a way, it's planned, but it's also it's spontaneous. It's very spontaneous what I do. It doesn't look it, because it looks very planned, but it's very spontaneous. I love technology, um, but it's dangerous. It helps us, it advances us, but it also, who's in control of it? We don't even question it. We just take it and we don't, we're putting tons of information on there. Who, who sees it? I mean, when I click on something on, um, online, it appears as an advert on my Facebook page. That's scary to me. Someone's gathering a lot of information about me and I'm just, you know, glibly doing it. You know, technology in itself is wonderful and we have the ability to put heaven on earth with technology. But then again, if the wrong people get hold of it, then we could have hell on earth. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, so that's part of my subconscious, really. So when I'm doing the thing about technology, and so I, I immediately go back to the 50s commercials and you know, the whole thing about uh, you know, General Electric and all these housewives with the big you know, pointy tits with the long skirts going, oh yes, I have a washing machine and a new car. And, and I was brought up with these commercials with the happy women in you know, these technological heavens. You know, you're, you, you, all these appliances are gonna help your life and appliances and buy, 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 and it's, you know, that's going to solve all your problems. And that's what's droned into me in a black and white television set, by the way. And look what it's done. Look at the earth now, look what happened. We thought we were giving, you know, solving humanity's problems and we're destroying the earth. Everything that's happening and anything that's going on in my life feeds my 
pictures and I'm working on something now it's called the dead factory it's it's, a, and it's another one it's a dead factory too or also but it's a big one and it's about holding this goddamn iPhone everyone's holding these iPhones and it's insane just you're looking down they're not even looking at each other and yeah it's about the, it's a hundred thousand million skeletons holding their iPhones it's you know, that's, that kind of thing, it's just everyday life or the news or whatever, anything that makes me angry. The things that really um, inspired me were the Flemish masters. And when I lived in Bruges, it was all there in the museums. I could just go there. I could just go there and sit in front of these paintings. And I used to go into churches and people thought I was praying, you know, but I was, I was praying to the art. There was a Michelangelo in Bruges. Uh, a Madonna and Child. I used to go sit in front of the statue and just pray to Michelangelo. <laughs> but you know, it was there, it was all there. And all these gorgeous paintings. Oh, and in Ghent, The Lamb of God by Jan van Eyck, which was the most amazing. They used to let you come right up to it. And it was a little man with white gloves, he used to open and close the picture every 20 minutes and so you had the the triptych closed and then he'd open it and you could go right up to it there was no glass or anything in those days and you could see every blade of grass I mean that thing was huge I would love to do something like that but it was and every diamond and every and I thought that's that's like God that's like seeing God this artwork is like a piece of God not that I believe in a god, you know, with, with uh, you know, in a nightgown with a white beard, and but that being able to do that is so amazing. I worked for a private library in Holland, an esoteric library. The man had the largest collection of books on alchemy and mysticism in Europe, private collection, and I was his artist for about ten years, and I did color pencil for him. I can do it. I mean, I used to paint too. I doesn't interest me. Color doesn't interest me. It is harder. It is much harder and much more challenging to make an entire universe with black and white. That's very hard. You know, you don't know until you try it. Color makes distance, it makes focus, but I'm just using grays. And that is incredibly challenging. And I like that. But the thing that made me choose black and white was Diane Arbus, the photographer. When I was a teenager, I saw her show in New York, and I was so shocked and taken aback because they were just portraits, but they were so stark, and it was almost surreal what she was doing. And because these people were not normal people, like normal people, it made it even more abnormal. If she had taken color photographs of these people, it wouldn't have been as shocking. And I thought, yeah, black and white is a whole atmosphere, you know? You could, it's a whole feeling behind that. And I liked that. I thought, yeah, that would work for what I'm trying to do. My mother had just died. And I have a Spanish friend in London. Maria Jose, and she said, come to Mexico with me, you will love this, it's a festival about death. And I said, no thank you, I don't know, I'm not interested. She said, come, come, come to the festival. I went, okay, 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 because she's very imperious, you know, you have to obey her. So she took me to the Day of the Dead festival, we went all around Mexico and we went to the graves at the middle of the night where they're picnicking. We went, oh, it was amazing things. And I was in awe of the festival because I'm a New Yorker and, you know, we don't mention death or an American, you know, just say they passed on or they're no longer with us. They're not dead. You know, I, you know no one dies or gets old, you know, that's it's only for losers. And here in Mexico, everyone was, you know, dressed up as skeletons and they it was very healthy it was lovely with candies with skeletons and and skulls and and I thought wow I'm going to do my own day of the dead show this is amazing 
And in a way, it was a good way for me to cope with my mother's death. It was re really a cathartic kind of experience to do that. And it's very funny as well because the Day of the Dead in Mexico is very colorful. And I'm black and white. And I did it in a New York Jewish black and white way. It was very funny. It was very funny. But it worked. It worked. And it was so successful. I did another one. And then I did another one. But uh, no more. Well, I'm doing one. I'm doing the skeletons with the iPhones, but still. I'm conceited, but I'm not that conceited. I don't think I can teach people or give them a message. I'm just trying to relate what I see. I'm interpreting what I see and feel. That's it. That's, that's all I'm doing. And some people look at it and get different messages, you know, totally different from what I intended or, you know, if I intended anything. I don't know. I'm just into the image at the time. And maybe, you know, years later I look back and go, oh, that's what that means, you know. But, you know, it just because I'm dealing with images, not words. If I was dealing with words, I'd be a writer. But I'm dealing with images, and they're more than words. Images are juicier than words. So it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So that's why trying to give a message to someone is a fool's game. Uh, a lot of artists do do that, do give messages, you know, try to give messages. But I'm just trying to show what I'm seeing or feeling. I once did a big show in London, and my parents flew over and my brother flew over and it was a show all about my mother you know very angry and about family and you know, I was in my 20s so that was the concern and my brother turned to my mother and said oh my god ma this is all about you how does that make you feel and my mother said better out than in so yes, I get it all out. I'm able to um, get in touch with my dark side instead of pushing it down. And if you push something down in a way, it has control over you more. Not that it doesn't have control over me, but you know, it's, um, it's healthier. My mother was a teacher and always told me, Lori, don't teach, whatever you do. <laughs> whatever you do, don't teach. It's difficult though, because my technique is so weird. People have said to me, my God, you work so much. Look how much work you have. But it's like uh, an addiction. This is, you know what? I just have to draw all day. That's all I have to do. It's like heaven on earth. I don't have to waitress. I don't have to go into a work, into a box office or a factory. It's, it's bliss. And everything else is work, like meeting people, going to parties, or going to, you know, making a show, or... That's work, but just sitting alone, putting on music and drawing is, I feel so blessed. And so when I, when I started drawing, I get it, it's like, you know, it's hard, to, it's like pushing a rock up a hill, it's hard to begin with, and then it starts making its own momentum, and then I hang on. Once I finish a drawing, I'm already in my head, I'm on to the next one. I'm, I'm on, I've got a whole backlog, I've got about 10 in there, and I have to keep going to get at them. So it doesn't matter. I mean, once, I mean, I like certain drawings, but I don't mind if they go. I'm not attached to them at all. I've done so many, so many, many drawings. I need to create more room for more. When I was in my 20s, I used to draw all night. And then when people were going to work, I'd close my curtains and go to sleep. And just go, you know, like. But now I can't do that. <laughs> now I'm just, you know, I wake up early, I draw, I can't stay up that late. You know, it's all different now. When I was 26 years old, I was kept flying back and forth from Europe to America to visit my parents. And you had to fill out a landing card and it said occupation. And the first time I ever put artist was when I was 26. I remember it was a very significant thing. I went, okay, all right. I'm living off my artwork. I'm selling my artwork. I'm doing my artwork. I'm an artist. It's art. <laughs> but I never, I never, when I was little, I didn't think I'd be an artist. I just wanted to draw. That's all. Just let me alone. Let me draw. <laughs> it's all I wanted. <laughs>